At the age of 22, Alice Robinson is the youngest candidate running in the Barry Springwater Oro Medante riding. We talked to her about her past work related to climate change and her plans for the riding. Hi, Alice. Hello. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Good. Thank you. So, I, uh, how is going? Is it? Busy knocking a lot of doors. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely <laughs> busy, you know, just trying to make the most of the time that we have left. Um, but you know, I, I do enjoy it. I love talking to people, so I can't say it's too stressful or anything. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it's less than a week now, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I want to uh, start a little bit, you know, you are the you are the youngest candidates uh, among among all the candidates, I, I believe. But you do have some, you know, previous experience uh, working on on various causes. So I think one of the one of them is is related to uh, related to climate change uh, when the, when you were in in Ottawa. So so can you tell me a little bit about how you got involved uh, in that in that cause and you know uh, what was the inspiration behind it? Absolutely. So I got involved at the in the Green Party Campus Club at Carleton in my first year. I didn't really have much of an active role because I had never really been in the political sphere. So I was kind of just seeing how it worked. But then by the time I reached second year, I thought, you know, well, I feel like I can take a more active role. I'm really passionate, especially about, you know, bringing attention to the climate crisis, but also to some social issues as well. So I took on the role of head of events. And that was kind of my introduction into the political sphere. So during that time, um, I helped coordinate one of Ottawa's first major climate strikes. So we worked with a bunch of, of youth-led groups from across the city. And what we did is we just brought a bunch of the organizers together to brainstorm, you know, who do we want to get to speak there? How are we going to outreach to get people to come out? Uh, stuff like that. So I think through that coordination process, it first off taught me how to work with like, community leaders, especially youth leaders. Uh, and then, yeah, that was a really amazing experience, I think, through that. So that's how I got involved with that one. And another event that I ran during my time of head of events was I put on a documentary screening and it was by an Ottawa filmmaker bringing attention to the homelessness crisis in Ottawa. And something I really liked about that experience is that we brought the people who were featured in the film to the screening to you know answer questions talk about what their needs really are um, from and you know because I feel like sometimes when people are talking about uh, homelessness it's very like let me tell you what you need rather than let me sit and listen to you tell me what you need uh, so I think that was what we really we didn't want to engage in the in the in the first one of that so yeah those were I think some of my most memorable experiences from the time that I was the head of events. So that was kind of my introduction into politics. Uh, and then that summer, I went to Victoria um, on Vancouver Island to work with a federal green campaign there. And that's, I think, when I learned the ropes of, of campaigning and how that works and all, all the ins and outs of that. And also, I think, connected me as well to more community groups and activist groups out in BC because uh, we were doing a lot of that, which is really, really awesome and very inspiring to meet a lot of people who've been doing frontline work for a really long time. And yeah, that's, I would say, my long-winded answer <laughs> to that one. No, no, that's great. So I'm, I'm just curious, why, why uh, Vancouver, Victoria, Vancouver, why did you decide to go there for campaign? Yeah, absolutely. So the Green Party at the time, they were just it was called Paint the Island Green and they were trying to engage youth more so on campaigns. So it was actually organized by the Green Party. They reached out to campus clubs uh, across, across the country trying to bring youth to the island because the island was at the time federally where they were making the most gains and where there was potential for the most growth uh, and just the biggest campaigns were happening there. So they actually, you know, did room and board. So I stayed with a, a member of the Green Party out there and yeah, it was just, it was kind of like a, a workshop for young people to be able to learn how to campaign. So, you know, in the future, hopefully we could run our own, which is, which is what I'm doing now. 
Okay, yeah, no, that's awesome. See, yeah, you you are you know, you are young, you know, you involved youth in in environmental uh, activism and you know in in local election, whether it's municipal or provincial, the involvement of youth is is not that much. You know, people say older people usually vote in this this election. So, how how are you trying to you know uh, what are you trying to do in order to engage more more young people in in your campaign? Yeah, I think. One part of it is just education. I actually don't think that a lot of youth, and you can say this is because of a, a not updated civics class, don't really understand the difference between, you know, a federal election or a provincial election and what, you know, what the issues are and how they can be heard, I think, in these spaces. So I think just reaching out to youth volunteers and being like, hey, these issues are directly affecting you and will affect your future and there are spaces for you to have a voice and to be seen and I think that yeah just having young candidates run in the first place is something that's really important for the youth because a lot of the time you know you see people who seem so very disconnected from your experience uh, and and just not you know maybe not aware or don't care about the things that that matter to you. And I, I think that when you have more youth stepping up and saying, you know what, no, we're going to, we're going to increase uh, the amount of voices that the youth have in these spaces, then I think that is something that, you know, helps youth turn out. Also just, you know, reaching out to know if you don't want to be, you know, the face, if you don't want to be a candidate and have to speak in front of people, because I know that can be intimidating, uh, know that there are roles there are roles in the back, you know, you can do door to door canvassing or phone canvassing, or you can just, you know, help with the organization, build policy, uh, send emails. Like there are so many different ways for youth to engage. Um, so I think, yeah, just letting youth know about all of the different options that are available to them. And then also just, yeah, educating more on, you know, these are the provincial issues and this is how it will affect you. No, that's interesting. And, you know, one of the issues that come to mind not, for example, affecting young people uh, is you know, at the federal level, they waived off the education loan interest until early 2023. And I think Ontario is one of the, maybe one or two uh, provinces in Canada that haven't. And most of the uh, most yeah. of the provinces have. And when, when I talk to young people, they are not aware about aware about about this issue that you know directly directly impact them so as you said you know there there needs to be more awareness about you know what are the issues that that you know uh, that impact youth and you know what they can do to get more involved in uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in politics yeah absolutely I think yeah if you brought up the student loans that's actually one thing that the greens we want to stop all interest on all student loans and then bring the loans that, sorry, excuse me, the grants that Doug Ford had changed to loans back into grants. Uh, and I'm not sure like how many youth are aware of that is a policy that we, you know, are, are promoting because no, no one should have to worry about having a drop out of school in order to, you know, afford to live, to afford to rent or, or have nutritious food on their table. And, you know, when I was in university, I remember when that I remember when that changed. I remember speaking to someone in one of my classes, being like, "You know what? I actually don't think I'm going to be able to come back next year because of this." Um, so yeah, I just want to let youth know that that is something we want to end all student loan interest, stop that completely, and then change these loans back into grants. Oh yeah, that sounds great. So one of the you know one of the platforms, of course, you know, your party is you know is pitching big on uh, new climate economy and i just you know before uh, before talking about that you know I, i'm not sure if you are you know following the follow the recent election in, in australia for example where the previous uh, liberal party which is you know which is a central right party in australia they got away with a lot of uh, environmental protections uh, laws in in australia so as and we have seen the wildfires in, in, in Australia. So as a result, there were a lot of independent candidates who fought on you know, climate change initiatives uh, have, have won. So do you, do you see the similar momentum in, in Ontario, in, in Canada, when it comes to uh, uh, the, the climate, climate action? 
Yeah, I definitely do think so. And again, especially among young people who really are aware that this is this is their future that is being affected and impacted. But it's also the present, you know, we see we saw it in BC, we saw it here with flooding. Like it's it is something that is now occurring. And I think you go back to, you know, how many people show up to these strikes and to make their voices heard. And sometimes I think that's the most accessible way for people to do. It's it's direct. You can see how many people really do support this. So I think, yeah, I do think I see a, a movement towards that. I, I don't necessarily see it as much among the like main mainstream parties as I would like to. I think climate has been ignored in this election by by the the main three big parties and I I'm it's unfortunate because you know there was so much momentum especially before the pandemic when more people were comfortable I think going out to on the streets and and protesting on behalf of the climate um but yeah I do I think I think it's very grassroots the the movement so I think it might not be it, it's not translated into the political sphere as as quickly as say I would like it like it too but I do think that there are advocates and I think there are advocates you know across party lines and this is one thing I do want to really emphasize is that climate is not a partisan issue addressing the climate emergency is going to take all of us and if we are consistently like bickering just about you know the validity of addressing the crisis in the first place we're not going to get anywhere so that's something that is really important to me is to work with whoever you know, sees it as, as the crisis that it is. Um, so I think that it's it's slower here maybe than, than it is in Australia, but it's in politics at least. But I think on the ground and in grassroots spaces, it is very present. So I think we just need to translate that into, into the political sphere. Great, so just briefly, I know the, the detailed plan is available on you know, Green Party website, but in, in a brief, you know, what do you think are the main uh, initiatives under new new climate uh, economy that that Greens are proposing? Yeah, well, the first thing is is we have to stop new fossil fuel infrastructure and gas hookups, which we plan to do by 2025. If we are continuing to build this infrastructure, we're never going to reach our climate targets. We also want to cut carbon pollution in half by 2030 and hit real net zero by 2045. And this starts with just taking over administration of the federal carbon fee system and increasing the price by $25 year over year until it reaches $300 a ton in 2032. And all carbon fee revenues that we collect from individuals will be returned in dividends. So making sure that carbon pricing system is in place has been known to be something that really does help reduce emissions, but also you know, setting aggressive targets for provincial spaces like hospitals, schools, universities, and putting a strong climate lens on all government decisions, I think. And then we also need to, you know, double Ontario's electricity supply by 2040 and make it emission free as quickly as possible in order to electrify things like transit and buildings. And I think on a different lens, it's also just about, you know, protecting the spaces, the natural spaces that are already helping prevent the climate crisis. So we want to protect at least 25% of lands and water by in Ontario by 2025 and 30% by 2030. And two things, but like doubling the green belt to include a dedicated blue belt to protected water systems is one of the ways that we want to do that. We also want to work with Indigenous communities to establish Indigenous protected and conserved areas where the Indigenous governments themselves have the primary role in protecting and conserving ecosystems through their laws and governance systems and knowledge systems. Because I really think that, you know, when, when tackling the climate crisis, it has to be done like in partnership with Indigenous governments, but led by Indigenous peoples who have been the stewards of these lands for longer than for time immemorial, really. And I think that when we approach the climate, if we're not doing so in a decolonial lens, we are not going to, to reach our target. So I think that's something that for me specifically is, is really, really important that that is something that is prioritized when we're when we're talking about transitioning towards a new climate economy. Um, we also want to provide things like startup funding for land community owned healthy food markets, community gardens and rooftop growing spaces. 
especially in like urban food deserts such as as cities and making sure that those where we place those are in communities that have historically lacked access to things like green space or community gardens because we know that you know certain communities do not have access to as much nutritional food so that is something that we really want to prioritize making sure we're doing that through a lens of equity I would say those are those are some of the the big ones that I have but I, I do recommend people check out our, our climate plan it is very detailed and very long I could be here forever <laughs> yeah so one of the you know you talk about the green bill so you know one thing comes to mind uh, uh, is the highways, you know, the highways proposed uh, by the Ford government, uh, Bradford Bypass and Highway 413. And there are recent news that, you know, government, because the election is just a week away and they want to just get started on the highway, even if even if they, you know, uh, lose, they want the highway to go on. So that's why, you know, they are, um, uh, you know, trying to get the, the as much properties as, as they can and uh, yeah. start to start the highway. So in terms of, you know, what do you think about, like, I understand in the Green Party stance is, you know, oppose, oppose the highways, but, you know, what do you think is the, is the rationale behind that? I think the rationale behind that is, first off, their construction. And if they do end up getting built, you know, just the amount of carbon that that will put into the atmosphere will just, put us so far away from reaching our targets. And it's just not, building highways is not something that climate leaders do. I think that's definitely our biggest rationale, but also just the ecosystems that are currently existing where they want the highways to be built are so valuable to our climate protection. I think the example I like to bring up a lot of the time is wetlands and their flood prevention. Wetlands, they they are protecting our communities by acting as natural like floodgates stopping stopping floods. And why, and if we look at that through like an economic sense, why would we risk like massive costs to our communities from having to incur flooding costs if we can just protect the spaces that are already protecting us in the first place? Like that, I think is something I, I like to bring up a lot of the time because these spaces are so valuable and just protecting biodiversity in, in general. And, and not even just about the flooding, but also they, they filter out contaminants in our water or wetlands. And these are just, these spaces are so valuable to us. And I think that there's not enough focus put on, on what their value is. And I think that something that I, I think is really important to us and that we wanna change is, is how, is how we view value, like the idea of value, which is why in our in our policy we talk about replacing GDP as the key metric of government success with an index of well-being, so to, to better measure societal progress and economic and environmental well-being. We need to start looking at value as not just something that you know is is based completely around profit, but around well-being, well-being of communities, well-being of individuals, and well-being of our environment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, oh no, another, another uh, thing that comes to you know, mind when we are talking about uh, the recent pandemic is, is healthcare and senior care. Those two issues you know, uh, were at the prominent in the last, uh, last uh, few, few years. We have seen the number of deaths in uh, senior care homes across Ontario and, and Canada. And we have also seen the backlog in, in, um, in healthcare systems, the surgeries and people dying, uh, mm -hmm. dying because of that. So how, how do you think those two issues uh, can, be, can be addressed? Yeah, I think if I'm gonna focus first on, on long-term care a little bit, I think, one of the biggest issues is our for-profit long-term care homes. We There was a, a science table report from January 2021 that stated that Ontario's for-profit nursing homes had 78% more COVID-19 deaths than nonprofits. So I think that's a, a really clear example of when we have these institutions that are set up not for care, but for for-profit, for their shareholders and, and things like that, then it is, is not providing the adequate care that our seniors need. And I think 
on a, on a bit of a different note, I, I have spoken to a lot more seniors who know if, if having the choice would like to remain at home for as long as they possibly can. So we really need to increase funding to home care. And I know that that, you know, requires, requires a lot, which is why we want to, you know, increase our funding to home care by 20%, which over the next four years would amount to like 1.6 billion in spending. And I think we also have to reimagine how we build our long-term care facilities in the first place. Like we, a lot of places are very institutionalized. They're outside of community. There's, there's no engagement with the larger community. And I actually do think that reduces the quality of life of the people who are living there. So we need to reimagine how we can integrate our seniors back into our community and not just place them far away from people to see, I think that that's an important aspect as well. Yeah, but I think we need to bring back just random inspections also of long-term care homes without any notice ahead of time to ensure that, you know, seniors are being treated with the dignity and care that they deserve. But I think that also, you know, has to do with making sure that those who are taking care of them are paid a fair wage and have the ability to bargain for fair wages, which is why, you know, we want to repeal things like Bill 124 and the problematic sections of Bill 106, because, you know, if you're someone working in this institution and you're barely able to meet and, and make ends meet yourself, or, you know, you have working hours that just run you dry, like that is not going to create a a system that you know takes it's you're not going to be able to take care of your patients in the way that you might want to because you are struggling yourself as well so I think we need to really support the people who are working there which is why we want to you know increase the wages of the um, registered practical nurses to $35 an hour and $25 to personal support workers as well to make sure that but also a, a part of our mental health plan is to cover mental health under OHIP and we wanna make sure that these individuals working in these spaces have access, access to adequate mental health care because you know, these, these staff are leaving the industry in, in record amounts because of things like burnout. And if we don't have the adequate supports to be able to care for the workers who are caring for our seniors, then it's, it's gonna continue that way. So we need to make sure that we are supporting them so they are able to be retained in these industries and also feel like they can do their jobs in a way that doesn't cause them too much harm in order to create the best care for, for those living there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And I didn't talk about wait times. Um, <laughs> so a part of our, uh, our plan about wait times is we want to fast track credential approvals for around 15,000 international healthcare workers to help address the staff shortage and expand we also want to expand the roles and scope of, of nurse practitioners as primary health care providers, especially in areas that lack this primary care option in order to help reduce the backlog. But we also want to increase our hospital based operating funding to a minimum of 5% year over year. And that would provide hospitals with about 2.4 billion over four years to help address the backlog. But we also need to work with, with the federal government regarding surge funding, specifically aimed at reducing backlog in surgeries, imaging, and other delayed services. And just, yeah, I, I just want to point out that this is something that's actually really important to me um, and, like, just personal to me, I think, when it comes to surgeries. I actually was on a wait list for a surgery for around about three, three and a half years. I had, a, and I got it. About a year ago, I had surgery on my ear because I'd lost um, some hearing in my ear. And I had my original surgery was planned for around April. And I had come back from Ottawa from graduating at this point. But when I had originally scheduled the surgery, I was still in Ottawa. So I had to drive to Ottawa for the surgery. And when I got there, literally like the day before it got canceled, and I had to go back home really disheartened. And like, I'm, I'm lucky, you know, my surgery was not something that was life-threatening, but knowing that there are people who are in surgeries that, you know, that really, really impact their quality of life, like things like hip surgeries or knee surgeries, there's, there's so many examples, those are just the first that come to mind, to have your surgery canceled 
after, you know, waiting for so long already, the amount of toll that that can really have on your mental health. And since like that was my experience, it was really disheartening to already wait, you know, three years and then have it be canceled and then have to be like, oh, when's it going to happen? And I'm lucky that it did end up getting to happen about five months later. But, you know, I really, I really feel for people in these positions. And I know that like, I, I hear you and I, and I feel, I feel you. <laughs> and it's just, um, it's something that is really personally important to me. And, and if I'm elected, it's something that I'll, I'll work, I'll work on a hundred percent all the time and make it a priority. Yeah. You, you talked about you know, indigenous issues when you, you know, uh, talked about climate change, but there are, there are other issues, you know, uh, when it comes to indigenous communities, whether it's, uh, whether it's, you know, past historic injustices, the mass graves that we found in, in, you know, um, in, in, in Canada. So, or, or, you know, the safe, safe drinking, safe drinking water. So what are the, I, I'm aware that there is not a very strong, uh, Indigenous population in in Barry, but there are there are some reserves nearby. Uh, so, what what do you think you know needs to be done to to address issues when it comes to Indigenous people? Absolutely, I think to start first off, I do really believe it is all of our responsibility to address our colonial past and present, and whether or not we have large Indigenous populations or not we are on indigenous land and especially my family's been here for I think I'm, I'm like the fourth generation so it, I know that I've had either direct or indirect effects on the displacement of indigenous populations so I really do feel it is my responsibility and I really hope more people feel that is their responsibility to work on decolonization and I think more to our policies a big Part of that is infrastructure, so making sure there is adequate housing in place in Indigenous communities. So we want to fund 22,000 Indigenous-owned and operated permanent homes under an urban and rural Indigenous housing strategy. And this is going to be, we want this to be led by Indigenous communities to create homes for them, because I think we need to be really careful not to impose upon Indigenous communities, but make sure that when we are building infrastructure, when we're acting in any policies, to ensure we're doing it in the most respectful way and, and through a decolonial lens. Uh, I think a part of that is also education. So we wanna restore funding for the indigenous curriculum program and work with indigenous educators and community leaders to develop a mandatory curriculum on colonialism and residential schools, but also on treaties, which I think is such an important aspect. You know, we are all treaty people. We are all living on treaty land. And the hard reality is that these treaties have not been fulfilled at all and first off a lot of them were also coerced so we need to be able to reckon with that and we need to you know educate the next generation of how are we going to fix this what are we going to do in the future to honor and respect treaties and to make sure that we are building communities in honor of those treaties so I think that's a really huge part of it but also just you know indigenous ways of knowing and ways of being into our curriculum as well I think that's that's really important when it comes to water, we want to, you know, provide, pro excuse me, sorry, <laughs> restore provincial funding for source water protection and expand drinking water source protection in northern remote and indigenous communities by providing adequate funding and training opportunities for a First Nations water authority to own and operate their own water and wastewater utilities to work towards finally ending boil water advisories. Um, and then I think more towards healthcare, we need to be able to work with Indigenous communities to identify and close the gap in health outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. And by doing so, we need to increase the number of Indigenous professionals working in healthcare through things like training and mentorship opportunities and ensure their retention in Indigenous communities, partic particularly in the North. And we also need to ensure that there are more Indigenous-led health clinics that are available. Um, thinking about some other things regarding that, when it comes to things like mercury contamination, which we we now has has happened in places like Grassy Narrows and Wabasi Moon, we need to provide evidence-based assessments in line with the recommendations for the Mercury Disability Board and ensure fair compensation is received from those who qualify. And we need to 
ensure that we immediately pursue government commitments to clean up mercury contamination. And that, I wanna move a little bit more into free prior and conformed in, in informed consent because you know we've promised to implement UNDRIP and a huge part of that is ensuring free prior and informed consent. Um, and this is especially important when we, you know, as we move towards a new climate economy, we're, and especially when we're regarding electric vehicles, there's been a lot of talk about the ring of fire and the minerals in the ring of fire. And I just want to make it clear that as much as I know that we, we need these mineral, minerals, I will not agree to move forward with any project unless free prior and informed consent is actually obtained. And I think we need to be really clear about what this consists of. And I wanna just give an example of where I think it was not this to, to be able to articulate my points. So in Attawapiskat, you know, the, the De Beers mine in the early 2000s came to the community and said, you know, we wanna, we wanna open our operations. Uh, how do you feel about this? Like we'll provide certain jobs. We'll give you a little bit of a compensation for this. And, you know, the community at the time, um, they, you know, lacked adequate housing. Their, their school had just had to be torn down. Like there, the community itself was struggling. And, you know, after some consultation and community meetings and such, they agreed to the project going forward. And, you know, years go by. And unfortunately, the compensation that was promised was not nearly adequate enough to be able to address things like like the housing uh, and you know issues that came along after in terms of things like water which actually was directly from the mine but do you, and the thing with this is it's not really prior informed consent in my opinion if the community does not have adequate enough resources to be able to say no in the first place. Like they had signed up for this because they thought it would end up helping the community, but the compensation was not nearly enough to do that. And it was like under the skies that it would. And I think that we have to be really careful when these companies come in and say, you know, I'm going to provide this compensation that's gonna help the community so much without, but then not being held to that. And it's, I guess, a bit of a, bigger conversation of like oh is it is it the company's responsibility to do that in the first place and whatever side you fall on that I think it, it doesn't matter as much because the government the Ontario government was receiving so much compensation from that project so much more than the community itself and it is the government's responsibility to provide those adequate infrastructures so while the government is you know making so much money off this project and the community that is directly affected is not nearly making enough to even, you know, update their housing, then we have an issue here. And that to me is not free and prior informed consent. So I think that when we, if we, if projects in the future, especially around the ring of fire and minerals move forward, we cannot repeat that. We have to make sure that there, there is actual very, very clear steps about, you know, we will provide adequate housing or update your health infrastructure. We, there cannot just be, oh, we'll just give you this small percentage of money and not tell you exactly what it's going to go for, go towards. I think we have to be really, really clear on that moving forward. Yeah, and, and my last question is about the, you know, the cost of living, uh, especially due to inflation, housing affordability, the prices, housing prices have come down a little bit recently, but you know, still, still not that much, you know, uh, that we had, you know, few few years back. So, what do you think, you know, and what is your party's plan to help people struggling with, you know, lower class, middle class struggling with, uh, you know, inflation and cost of living issues? Yeah, absolutely. We want to start with a continuous increase in the minimum wage each year by $1 starting at $16 in 2022. But I want to make it clear that that includes a top up in cities where the cost of living is higher in places like, like Barrie, like Toronto, like Ottawa. Um, but I also want to say a lot of people living in poverty are living in legislated poverty, which is why we will immediately double the Ontario Works as, as well as the Ontario Disability Support Program. 
Um, and that's a, as a first step in implementing a basic income, which is an end goal for us. And we all, I also just want to make it clear that with our immediately doubling of OW and ODSP, that will be tied to future increases in inflation. Um, so I think we also need to make sure we are maintaining all existing supplementary supports that are available with those current income assistance programs. We also want to include like meaningful consultation with people who have lived experience with poverty and existing social assistance programs in the design of all programs and services aimed at client-centered approaches for reducing poverty. And we want to create annual reports of disaggregated data on the proportion of the population experiencing things like chronic homelessness or unmet health needs, food insecurity, lack of literacy and low paid work. We also wanna provide all workers, no matter if you're permanent, part-time, temporary or casual with full and equal access to employment rights and benefits programs such as EI, CPP, WSIB, as well as equal pay for equal work. And you know, we also have a lot of, of gig workers. So we want to ensure that we create a gig workers bill of rights. Um, and end the misclassification of employees, enact a uh, presumption of employee status and the ABC test under the Employment Standards Act and ensure that there are payment for all hours of work from app sign in till sign out with a clear and concise breakdown of how pay is calculated and ensure gig workers real wages are not reduced below the minimum wage by compensating for necessary work related expenses. We also are developing a program of portable extended health benefits for workers in the gig economy and retail and hospitality sectors that is tied to the employee, even if they are to change employment. And regarding um, housing, we want to build 182,000 permanently affordable uh, community housing rental homes over the next decade and manda mandate inclusionary zoning and require a minimum of 20% of affordable units in all housing projects above a certain size. We also, regarding, you know, addressing homelessness, we need to take a housing first approach to this and doing so requires building 60,000 permanently affordable community supportive housing spaces. And that has to include wraparound supports like psychologists, like addiction support specialists, like employment service workers. And a part of that is also making sure that there's a portion of those houses that are specifically dedicated to those with very complex needs. And I think we also are extending the financial support to 311,000 Ontarians, Ontario households via the affordable housing benefit. And we want to it, like, sorry, <laughs> we just want to also support municipalities to safely build affordable housing on things like previous industrial sites and existing neighborhoods by reinstating the provincial brownfield remediation fund and build on top of commercial spaces, transit stations and vacant parking lots and launch a province wide yes in my backyard initiative to address NIMBYism and raise awareness on the benefits of infill middle housing, mid rise and community housing developments in existing neighborhoods. We also want to reinstate rent control and ensure that landlords are not able to evict long-standing tenants on the guise of things like rent eviction so bad faith evictions we have to be we have to strengthen those penalties on things like that and again yeah reinstate rent controls on all unit right um increases year to year and implement vacancy control to limit rent increases between tenancies and regarding food we want to implement implement a grocery code of conduct to protect you know local farmers consumers and food producers to ensure that everyone is able to access quality nutritious food without having to worry about not being able to afford it. So I think there's there's a lot of areas of policy from you know from wages to housing to to food. But I think that's that's what you have to do. You have to take an intersectional approach to address the cost of living. There's no one size fits all. It's about making sure all of these policies work together to to create the best well-being for, for the population. Yeah, thank you. And you know, the the last question, you know, in your, uh, you know, in Barry Springwater or Madante writing, we have the you know current MPP Doug Downey, and for the Liberal Party candidate is you know Jeff Lehman, who is you know, uh, a mayor of Barry, you know, who was elected with more than ninety percent of the vote. So we have two very strong candidates uh, uh, in 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 this writing. So. 
what is you know what would you say to the to the voters uh, in your last pitch that you know what is what is that you, that you offer that is different or or better than these two you know uh, candidates or you know seasoned politicians I would say. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I think the first thing that comes to mind is you know just being a young person. I offer a new and fresh perspective to policy. I'm looking at the world from a different lens. And I think that's really valuable to be able to challenge, I think, just like the way of thinking in politics for a really long time and to, yeah, and to counter that. I think that's, that's a huge part. And I think I'm just also, I'm not held down by anyone like, like lobbyists, you know, I haven't, because I haven't been in the political sphere for a long time, I don't have people who, or companies or lobbyists, you know, being like, you have to implement this. This is really important. Like, I won't rest until this gets done. I feel like I, I'm really separate from that, which I think, you know, can be can be a really great thing because I can act on my conscience. Ah, and yes, this is something that I sometimes forget to mention. That's really important. The Green Party is the only party that doesn't whip votes. So, the other parties, you know, there's a bill that is going to get passed or going to not get passed and their leader tells them you know all the party has to vote this way so they get a sheet of paper and they have to vote that way greens don't do that we are able always to vote by our conscience and to vote on behalf of our constituents and that is something that i think really makes us stand out and really you know means that i can approach everything i do from a place of honesty and a place of through my conscience again like that is something that's really really important to me and i think that's what makes me different from these candidates yeah that sounds great so uh thank you so much elise uh, for your time and talking to me today uh, and all the best uh, with your campaign thank you so much i really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me you take care